I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and welcome to Scripture and Tradition, where we take a look at the words of sacred revelation in the written Scripture, as well as the apostolic tradition that goes back to the apostles and our Lord Jesus Christ as the source. And we want you to be part of the show by adding your questions or comments. You can do so by calling in during the live program, which is at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And the phone number is in North America is 1-800-221-9460. 1-800-221-9460. If you are not in North America, then you can still call, but you have to call Country code 1, area code 205-271-2980. You can also send us questions and comments by email by writing to Scripture and Tradition at EWTN.com or follow us and participate with the show on Facebook and YouTube. Now today we will take a look at how our Lord goes to a synagogue and it becomes a battleground and how this caused the Pharisees and the Herodians to plot to kill him just because he healed a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath. Okay? So for this section... We are taking a look at Mark chapter 3, verse 1 and following. You can follow along with us in this program by looking at my book, Praying the Gospels, Jesus, Miracles in Galilee, which is available at EWTNRC.com. That's our religious catalog, EWTNRC.com where it is item number 52885, 52885. All right, let's start to take a look at this fourth chapter in that book, and we'll take a look at Mark chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. It says in verses 1 and 2, Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, come forward. Now, first of all, the, this, the opening two verses deal with three different elements. Okay? First, Jesus enters the synagogue as was his custom throughout his ministry. We saw how St. Luke had said it was our Lord's custom to go to the synagogue. And it's important to understand, uh, we've talked a little bit about Pharisees before, it's important to understand something of them. The Pharisees were primarily a movement of lay people. The Sadducees were a movement that composed the priests and the nobility. But the Pharisees were primarily laity. In fact, the word Pharisee means perushtim, uh, it comes from the word perushtim, meaning the separated ones. They've separated themselves out from people who do not observe the law. And the synagogue was their institution. That's where they did their teaching. They trained rabbis and they taught. Second, we see that there's a man with a withered hand also present. Now, presumably, it was his custom to come to the synagogue on Sabbath as well. And he was there to pray. He wasn't coming there in order to find some healing. 
he wasn't there to cause trouble. Um, he's there simply minding his own business and praying as he normally would do. That would be the way I'd picture him. Third, there are some other people who are also unnamed who are so opposed to Jesus already that they are looking for a way to accuse him of breaking the Sabbath or some other sin or crime so that they can basically silence him. Or as we would say in these last few years, they want to cancel him. Okay? So this is an early part of cancel culture. Uh, modern society hasn't invented cancel culture, but they've just brought it to wider media. Now, this scene with these three elements is filled with tension. And the question is, will our Lord's opponents be able to induce him to do something wrong and find some reason to accuse him. They're not approaching him with goodwill. And again, in our modern times, we should be well alert that lots of people do the same thing today. Um, one of the points that we're starting to see is that a lot of modern people are uh, very surprised uh, at the way government, the media, and other parts of society are becoming increasingly antagonistic to religion, even as religion continues to grow worldwide. So you don't hear that from most of the media. They don't like to report it. But Christianity is still the fastest growing religion in the world. We don't see it growing in the Western countries. But in the Eastern Hemisphere, it's growing. Today, for instance, is the feast of uh, St. Andrew and the other Korean martyrs. A lot of people are not aware that Korea, South Korea that is, is no longer a majority Buddhist country. It's a majority Christian country. Africa is no longer a majority Muslim continent. It's a majority Christian continent. Christianity is growing through around the world, but also there is growth taking place among Muslims. Growth and enthusiasm, uh, enthusiasm taking place among Hindus. Uh, there, one group after another. It's primarily in the West where you see two things going on. One, a strong attack on religion and a decreasing interest in it, as well as decreasing population where people don't believe in God. It's a little clue I'd like to give you. If they don't believe in God, they don't believe in the future. All they have is this life. They don't believe in heaven or hell, so they have only this life. And that's what they focus on. And babies are about the future, so they don't want them. And they don't have them. That's all over Western Europe, Canada, United States, Australia. These are places where population, and Japan, by the way, is going down. Russia is decreasing. They're starting to have some turnaround there. But you watch, China will also experience decrease. And this will be very much related to their use of a Western philosophy called communism. So we see lots of antagonism to religion, in particular Christianity, in the West. In fact, you see a number of things. In the early part of the first two decades of this century, people started calling Christians haters. 
That's how they designate us. We saw just recently an article that uh, said that traditional Catholics have weaponized the rosary. They're scared of us praying the rosary. <laughs> Good, because that was for the Atlantic Monthly, and I've started including them in my regular praying of the rosary every day. I pray for them, so we'll, we'll turn a spiritual weapon on them for their good. Um, but this is what's going on. And the threats against Catholic churches, for instance, over 200 Catholic uh, institutions have been attacked this year alone because of our opposition to abortion. And they're doing this in order to keep us quiet about abortion as it comes up on various election issues. There are people who don't want us, the secular folks <coughs> do not want us to speak against abortion. And they are very angry with the Catholic Church on that. They go into a rage. So this is something that we have to deal with. And you know, given that so many modern people are moral relativists, they don't believe in truth, they don't believe in uh, an abs uh, natural law, things like that, they reject that, they become all the more uh, argumentative, but they don't really engage us in reasoned article, uh, arguments because they don't know how. I'm going to be very frank. The reason that they use cancel culture and just say, shut up, you can't talk, you're a Christian, you're a Catholic, we don't want to hear from you. That anger and that silencing comes because they are too ignorant to defend their position. They keep saying it's a woman's body, for instance. It's not her body that they're killing. They're killing a distinctly different body, the body of a child. But they don't want to talk about it. We can't. Just shut up. That's all they've got. That's all they've got. And they, their last-ditch effort is when they catch us as sinners, which we are. We are. You can't ask my confessor, but, you know, I'm one of them. All of us are among the sinners. And so what they try to do is catch us in hypocrisy. That's one of their, uh, because they, if they can't argue, they'll say, all right, well, you're a hypocrite. Um, yeah, you know, there's, there are times in which I'm inconsistent in my morals, and I keep asking God's grace to improve me. But... This is the reality. As a matter of fact, it's in our New Testament. In the first letter of St. John, chapter 1, verse 8, St. John wrote, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. This is Christians speaking about Christians. We may not deny that we are without sin. That's why we need to go to confession. That's why Jesus Christ gave the church confession, so that we can con admit our sins, confess them, and seek God's grace to improve. However, that there are many who can accuse Christians, Christians of hypocrisy and other sins, but they're not doing anything to help us become more holy. They simply want to control us or more likely. Uh, and by the way, how do they control us? They want us to be afraid. Don't speak up about the issues of life against euthanasia and abortion because we just might attack your churches some more. Like I said, over 200 have been attacked already this year. You say something about life, we'll come after you. They want us to be afraid so we'd be quiet. But at all costs, they want us to be neutralized and end our, if not destroy our influence. Now, this is something we have to pay attention to. It's an accusatory spirit. It's the attitude of accusation. 
And I want to give you a little clue. and The Bible helps us with this. The word Satan in Hebrew means accuser. When they are being accusers, they are siding with Satan's approach. And in Greek, the word diabolos, from which we get the word devil, diablo in Spanish, from this word in Greek, we, we, get, we refer to Satan because it means prosecuting attorney. That's what a diabolos is as opposed to a paracletos, a paraclete. A paraclete is a counselor or lawyer for the defense, while the diabolos is the accuser. And it's important to note that in the first letter of St. John, chapter 2, verse 1, it says, our paraclete is Jesus Christ. He is the one who is the lawyer that stands for us. And then our Lord Jesus also said in John 14, verse 16 and 26, and in John 15, verse 26 and 16, verse 7, repeatedly our Lord says, the Holy Spirit of truth is the paraclete. He's your defense lawyer. And pay attention to that great scene of this cosmic battle between St. Michael and Satan. Satan loses, of course. He can't stand up to God. And when he's defeated and, and falls down, John says in Revelation 12, verse 10, then I heard a loud voice in heaven proclaiming, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our comrades has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. Again, you see that Satan is the accuser. Christ is our defender. People who talk about, oh, I'm trying to get over Catholic guilt. So often that guilt is not something that comes from the church. It's the accusatory voice of Satan as opposed to Jesus Christ who says to confess your sins and he will give mercy and forgiveness. This is key. And we are dealing with an anti-Christian movement that very much wants to accuse us, and that's exactly the experience that our Lord has in that synagogue. There are people looking to accuse him. And you should ask yourself, as you think about Christ in that synagogue, ask yourself, what would he say to you about what it was like for him to be living under this ongoing threat of accusation. What would that be like? And the many times people were accusing him falsely, all the way up to the court of Pilate and the Sanhedrin, what would he say to you about his experience and your experience and my experience of being accused? What would he say about the way you deal with the opposition to you for your faith? How would you, what would he talk to you about with that? Ask him. And conclude your prayer time with the Lord's Prayer, with the Our Father. And trust that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We'll take a little break and we'll come back to this same episode in Mark 3, so please stay with us.
right, welcome back. And I just want to mention that for the first time in oh, about three years or so, because of the pandemic, EWTN celebration is back. I don't know if you heard how on Sunday President Biden said the pandemic is over. COVID's still here, to be sure, but the pandemic is over. So now that it's over, we're going to have a family celebration in Phoenix, Arizona. This is free, good price, and it's a one-day event. And you can meet your favorite EWTN hosts like Doug Keck, Johnette Williams, Marcus Grodi, Father Pedro Nunez, and they're even letting the Jesuits come too. So what are they thinking? I don't know. But you can meet Father Robert Spitzer, SJ, and you can meet me, SJ, <laughs> as well. There will be talks and questions and answer sessions and food. Plus, you have a chance to visit the Family Corner, the EWTN Religious Catalog Shop, and no family celebration would be complete without opportunities to pray the rosary together, go to confession, you do that on your own, uh, and attend mass, all with the help of the Franciscan missionaries of the eternal word. So in order to register and get more information, go to EWTN.com slash family celebration, EWTN.com slash family celebration. They'll give you all the information and you can afford that ticket. It's free. So please come and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to meet y'all. All right. I'd like to now take a look at the second meditation on Mark chapter 3. This is where Jesus challenges his opponents to love or hate. So it starts off in verse 3. Jesus said to the man who had the withered hand, come forward. So he's, you know, taking this situation on. Now, nobody has said anything out loud as we've seen before, for instance, with the healing of the paralytic that was brought through the roof. Christ knows the inner thoughts of his opponents. He knows what they're thinking. That's part of his divinity. That as God, he knows the hearts and minds of, other, of all people. So he's going to step this up. And this is very much, uh, a matter of fact, a, a good, trans, I think a slightly better uh, translation of the Greek is, Stand up in the middle. That would be my literal translation of the Greek. And by commanding this man to, to do so, Jesus is provoking the issue. He's not saying, oh, I you know this, this wouldn't be politically correct. I mean, it might offend some of their sensitivities. I really should, you know, just let this be and not do anything. That's often one of my temptations. You know, I don't want to just provoke anything. Sometimes I do. Um, but a lot of times, uh, sometimes too often I don't. It's not our Lord's way. Um, he is very much willing to bring the issue to a head uh, for those who are looking for a reason to accuse him of something. So at that point in verse 4, it's Jesus asks a question. Now he asks it as a question form. He could have just made a statement, but he asks a question because he wants to provoke interior thought. He, that's a good way to approach things. You ask a question. And he asks, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? to save life or to kill? That's his question. And he wants them to think about it. And by asking the question, is it lawful? He is using terminology that is very much part of the Pharisees' way of thinking. This is very much their thought. 
that they uh, were always questioning if something is lawful. The reason they did that was, in their day, many of the priestly class had so identified with Greek culture and then later on with Roman culture as a way to accommodate themselves to the ruling powers that they began to act more like Greeks and Romans. When you look at the houses of priests in Jerusalem, the, the ruins of the houses, you see that they are decorated just like the houses at Pompeii, except there are no dirty pictures. In Pompeii, they had a lot of dirty pictures. But in uh, Jerusalem, they didn't do that. that. That was too much. But they, otherwise, they decorated just like in Pompeii. They imitated Roman style. And they'd done that with the Greeks before that, back in the second century B.C. Where the Pharisees, the slave movement, said, no, we are not to be like the pagans but we are to follow the law of God. This was a good motive. But this is something where they went to uh, something of an extreme because it says in the law that you are not to work on the Sabbath. The Pharisees had a principle called placing a fence around the law, putting a fence around Torah. So to uh, a good example would be the law says you may not cook a kid goat in its mother's milk. Okay. So they said to make sure we'll have one set of dishes we use only for milk products and another set of dishes only for meat products just to make sure that nobody accidentally mixes a particle of goat milk with some meat. So that, that, that's what they meant by putting a fence around the law. And with this, they were very, very precise about what you could do on the Sabbath. You couldn't light a fire, things like that. And you could only walk a certain number of steps in between each meal of the day. Um, they, they, they just set those rules out. But Jesus doesn't go back to those principles of putting a fence around Torah. He goes to the most basic issues and asks if it is right to do good or evil, to save life or to kill. This is the tension that he sets before them. Because doing good on the Sabbath should be permissible and therefore healing a man, not doing surgery, but by his word to heal. That's what he wants to do. And um, to, he, one of the implications of our Lord's words is that to not heal the man would be equivalent to taking his life. It would be doing him harm. That's one of his issues. And he also uses the word kill rather than simply neglect because, in fact, there is growing tension between the Pharisees and Herodians versus Jesus. That's going to be ongoing. So he knows that his death is inevitable. He knows that his death is coming. And he's not afraid of the tension. He doesn't let the reluctance to suffer death keep him away from dealing with the issues. So he wants the true issue of the man with the withered hand to come forward. And he knows that his uh, opponents are not really committed to the deeper issues of God's goodness and giving of life. They're not committed to life. And we have to pay attention that he is committed to the truth and they are not. 
they're committed to keeping their own position. Again, not at all unlike modern times. So, we should picture Jesus in the crowd inside the synagogue, most of them sitting on the floor with this one man standing up. And ask our Lord, speak to him, what, it's li- what is it like to speak up to people in our society? The various people who denied the truth of God's commandments. We live at a time when they're not only saying that God's commandments about adultery and such are irrelevant. Even questions about life and protecting human life, not only in the womb, but even letting murderers go free. Well, we don't want to keep murderers in prison. We're going to let them out. This is part of the news. And we have to speak to the truth of God's commandments when others don't want to. Ask our Lord about how you have to speak to that truth. Ask our Lord to give you a grace to be courageous, to be strong enough to stand up to what's true simply because it's true. should have nothing to do with politics. We judge all politics by the truth of God's law. And we want to have the courage Jesus showed in the synagogue. Let us ask for that. And again, I recommend that you conclude with the soul of Christ prayer. Soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, feed me. Blood of Christ, inebriate me. Water from the side of Christ, wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. Within your wounds, hide me. Pray that prayer so that you get strength from Jesus. That's his grace of strength. And all of us need to have that. Okay? All right. Let's now take a look at some of the questions. We have a studio audience here. We have a question. Father, where are you from? Thank you, Father. Thanks for the presentation. And I enjoyed every bit of the exposition you. you did. My name is Father George Jassy. I'm from Ghana. But I minister in the Diocese of St. Petersburg in Florida, nice. Tampa, Florida. It's a wonderful place. Yeah, I help out in hospital and also parish ministry. Okay. My question is about the weapon of accusation. Mm-hmm. In these days, it's very common. And one of the constant attacks mm-hmm. of the church mm-hmm. is the weapon of accusation. I'm, yep. I'm happy that you mentioned that the accuser is always uh, is acting as a thorn in the flesh. So what is the accuser supposed What is the constantly accusing us and what is that supposed to achieve with that kind of accusation? And what should be our response? Here's, there there are a couple reactions that the evil one is looking for from us. If you get accused, well, uh, and I've I've known people in this situation, they get accused of something and say, well, I I didn't think I was doing that. I mean, they begin to have self-doubt and they question themselves, as opposed to having faith in Jesus Christ, that the accusation brings self-doubt. And oh, maybe, maybe I don't know, you know. And and you add to that in these times, a lot of people are not well informed. I I was watching on a, a television show where they were asking, People, they said to a group of folks in their 20s, maybe 30, um, the Queen of England was just buried today. What country is she from? And only one of them knew the answer. They just said she's the Queen of England. (laughs) And they didn't know. That's it. Europe? Well, yeah, but she's not the Queen of Europe. She's the Queen of England. And there's just that kind of... You know, that that indicates a lack of knowledge that sometimes is used to help increase self-doubt. That's something that's key. As opposed to having faith in Jesus Christ. 
Another thing is, and remember, Satan is a liar and the father of lies. And very frequently, you will hear people say false things about Catholic teaching, about Catholic history, all kinds of things. Well, the Catholic Church was in favor of slavery. Yeah, we actually, the popes put it under automatic excommunication. As soon as the Atlantic slave trade started in 1425, Think about that. That's almost 70 years before Columbus came to the Western Hemisphere. And it was already, and that was repeated all the way until the end of slavery in the Christian countries. So, I mean, you'll hear th all kinds of accusations. And if you don't know history, you think, wow, I didn't realize that maybe I am in the wrong place, the wrong religion. And lots of other so the accusations are meant to have doubt. Secondly, secondly, besides the doubt, it's meant to make us afraid to move. It's meant to make us immobile. Well, gee, I don't know. Maybe this, you know it's wrong. That self doubt then says maybe I should just go, just stay quiet. That fear that comes with the self doubt is a very typical reaction. This is a way to undercut faith in Jesus Christ. That's one of the things that's key. All right. And there, there'll be, I'm sure that evil one has other tricks up his sleeve that I'm certainly unaware of. Um, you know, I'm not as smart as Satan, that's for sure. But again, that's why we need Jesus and the Holy Spirit to help us as our paracletes. Here's one from Matthew in Tacoma, Washington. Father Mitchell, I was hoping you could help me with Luke 10, verse 8. I grew up in the church as a Protestant, always understood that Peter was the first to declare foods and the entering of Gentile homes clean. Am I confusing the Samaritans as Gentiles when I should not? Because in Luke 10, verse 8, Jesus is sending the 72 to Samaria and tells them to enter the house of whoever welcomes them and to eat whatever is set before them. Who said it first? Well, Jesus said it first. But the, keep this in mind about the Samaritans. The Samaritans were an ethnic mix. They were Israelites, so they're from their roots are not what the Jews. Remember, the word Jew is a shortened form of Judah. It's the tribe of Judah that is the basis for the Jews. The other tribes, that's why St. Paul doesn't call himself a Jew. He's a Benjaminite. He comes from the tribe of Benjamin. And that's one of the northern tribes. And the uh, uh, Samaritans were also descendants of northern tribes, especially Ephraim and Manasseh, which were in that region in the central highlands. But they also mixed with Gentiles. So there was a mixture there. And so they also kept kosher laws. They had the Torah. They still have. Uh, there's a Samaritan uh, Torah uh, that's written with different alphabet. They don't use the same alphabet that uh, for Hebrew that the others do, but they're, they're, it's in Hebrew and um, but the Samaritan dialect. And, you know, this is um, uh, something that they would still keep the kosher laws, maybe not with the, the rules of the Pharisees, because they didn't have Pharisees among the Samaritans, but this was um, something that they would definitely keep kosher, okay? So they could eat with whatever the Samaritans had. They weren't Gentiles, okay? All right. We're going to take a little break. We'll come back with more of your questions, your calls, and your emails. So please stay with us.
right, we have another question from our studio. Sir, where are you from? Uh, I'm from Tampa, Florida, Father. My name is Ed Bilbao. Okay. And so thankful for having us in this wonderful show Good of to yours. to have you here. Uh, but as I mean, uh, I and my wife are just so blessed to be, to have driven these two wonderful priests uh, to attend your show. Great. Thank you for coming. So what's your question? So my question is, uh, while there are a lot of tensions in our everyday life, mm -hmm. especially in our Catholic life, mm -hmm. uh, this is much more um, prevalent and, uh, and uh, also very common, especially uh, when w Roe v. Wade was overturned, mm -hmm. that uh, with regards to our position with uh, defending life, yes, uh, especially in in the political arena, sure. where uh, there are a lot of tensions mm -hmm. going on, um, we are accused all the time of being weaponizing our position, uh, especially in those areas that I spoke about when there are a lot of people who don't believe in what we believe. Right. And uh, we are, in a sense, just ramming this position down their throats. Yes. Without us, uh, without us really explaining to them what, what it is all about. Let me ask you this. How many people have you rammed anything down a throat? I haven't personally. No, no. And that we are not ramming anything down throats. This is, uh, uh, and one of the things to always pay attention to, pay attention to this, they, a lot of times, the very thing that they accuse us doing when we're not doing it, is something they are doing. It's a way to cover up that they are doing what they accuse us of. And so, you know, um, people did not vote to make abortion legal. Nine men on the Supreme Court came up with that based on specious reasoning. And another court made of men and women has said, no, that's not good law. That's not a good interpretation. And so we're, we're just saying that it's not good law. Uh, well, it's not we. And furthermore, what we're saying is that you don't want, it's not that we're ramming something down anybody's throat, but they are ramming a knife into a baby's body. That's what's at stake. And don't let them make us forget it. A knife is shoved into a living child and the arms are cut off. It's not a blob of cells. It's got it by the time they get a hold of it and they can do an abortion, it's got its own fingerprints. All of its DNA is there. And they are cutting off its arms, cutting off its legs and smashing the skull. Who's ramming what down throats? They're ramming a knife and something to squeeze the, the life out of a baby's skull. Don't let them get away with this. Always think through that what they're saying is probably what that we're doing is probably what they're doing. We have another question from our studio audience. Father, where are you from? I'm Father Prakash Rumau. I'm from Basin. And it what is country is that in? Wasai. It is from India. India. Welcome. Sub well, you win Mumbai. the long distance award today. So what can we do for you today? Of course, I came uh, in July to experience a monastic life uh -huh. in the monastery Genesee in Rochester. Okay. After that, now, a few days, I am here with my friends in Tampa, Florida. Yes. Thank you, Father, for enlightening me on this topic today. 
the scriptures and traditions. Yes. I'm enjoying the talk show. Thank you. As uh, Father George said about a cuisine, and while back also in India and all over I see, we are not only accused of one thing, but several things. As recently, maybe a year ago or more, Pope Francis said, the modern slavery that is human trafficking that is going on all over the world. Mm -hmm. And we Christians are really fighting, rescuing a lot of girls and children. Also, recently we had one death of a Jesuit priest, Father Stan Swami. He was accused as a terrorist and he was denied a straw because he could not drink tea or coffee or whatever food that was given because of his illness and he died in the jail. Mm -hmm. And we are accused because we create among the people uncomfortable because people sometimes they are uncomfortable with things that go on and when there is some issue we try to create an uncomfortable atmosphere and, and we are and all in fact, accused. And in fact that same priest was somebody working with uh, what people call the tribal, tribal folks yes. who don't always have the same rights yes. as everybody else even though of course they're citizens, yes. but their rights are not often respected. And by standing up for their rights yes. as disenfranchised people, he was accused of being a terrorist when he was just trying to be a good priest. This is something that we have to be alert to. And remember, you know, in the, one of the terrible things of the history of the Western Hemisphere is that 12 million Africans were brought to North and South America as slaves. And that was over a period of a few hundred years. In this country from 1619 until 1810 or 11, something like that, um, they were bringing Africans over. And then they kept slavery uh, in this, when in America, when it was its own independent nation, we had slavery here for about uh, 80 years, 70, 80 years, you know, as an American country. Before that, we were British colonies, as you had been a British territory, and we were under British law. But when we had our own law, it lasted for about 80 years, 70, 80 years. And it's important to note that that was absolutely horrendous. That was just an evil. And the, one of the problems was that people who were enslaving Africans disobeyed and ignored papal teaching and the automatic excommunication, exactly the way they do with the automatic uh, excommunication entailed in getting abortions or doing abortions. They ignore it. It's no different. But then we look at today's world, and there are well over 40 million slaves. There are about four times as many slaves today as were brought over from Africa over a couple hundred year period. This is a grave evil. And Pope Francis and many other and lots of Catholics are working to prevent it to rescue, and at great risk, priests and nuns are killed in Mexico for opposing this. They're decapitated. You don't hear a lot about it, but it's going on down there, also for opposition to the drug trade. So this is the kind of thing that, yeah, we're going to, Christ got opposition in this synagogue all the way to Calvary, and we'll have to deal with our opposition as well and be faithful, faithful. Well, I'd like to get to uh, an interesting email from uh, Megan in Phoenix. Um, uh, this is, uh, see, it says, Hello, Father Mitch, I grew up Catholic along with a younger sister. My sister looks up to me and everything, 
and she's dating an atheist. And I'm wondering what she should do about her relationship because he helps her with mental health. However, he is an atheist. Megan in Phoenix. Uh, Megan, you know, this is something that's a, it's a good question. You know, and what uh, it'd be good, you know, her mental health is very important. But A, you know, the, it, for someone who is helping with mental health, I don't know what you mean by that. Is it her therapist? If so, sometimes that's a difficulty where you're breaching the professional relationship. And th see, that should be examined. I don't, I don't know the whole situation, but that should be examined. Secondly, is he, does he think like Freud, who thought that religion and, and Christian faith makes you mentally ill? Does he say that to her? And therefore, therapy means getting over her Christianity? I don't know. You know, so I, I don't know enough from there, but that'd be something to help. And then also, you have to ask her, how are you allowing Christ our Lord to help you in that healing process with your, you know, your uh, emotional or mental issues? How does that help? Find some of those things out and have a good conversation, uh, lots of conversations with her. She deserves a lot of respect. Just as she respects you, you have to respect her and try to help her to incorporate her faith with her growing mental stability and with this relationship with a man who doesn't have faith. Have them pay attention to that and see that um, there's mutual respect, that you know, he has to respect her Catholic conscience. Um, that'd be a very important thing. If there's not that kind of respect, the relationship is going to be too one-sided, especially if he is some kind of a therapist, okay? All right, well, running out of time. Thank you all for being with us. Hopefully many of you will see over in Phoenix, but until then, may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. May he lead you in all of your ways by his peace. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, this whole network is brought to you by you. Our Lord inspired Mother Angelica to do it that way instead of getting advertising, things like that. She wants it to depend on you and your commitment to Christ. So we ask you, as we always do, as she did, to remember to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll be able to pay our bills too. Thank you, and God bless.